This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man talking first to a receptionist and then to a doctor at a health centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3 on page 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. How can I help you? Uh, yes, I'm a visitor to this area. I had a sporting accident a little while ago, and I'm still in some pain. And I wondered if I could see a doctor here. Certainly, sir. We can take you on as a temporary patient. I'll just take down some personal details. Can I start with your name? Yes, it's Peter. Peter Smith. Right, Peter. And where are you staying here? At 95 Cross Street. And the suburb? Walkley. That's W-A-L-K-L-E-Y. Mm-hmm. And can I have a contact phone number? Uh, it's 4689-5324. Thanks. Okay. If you just wait down there, the doctor will see you in a minute. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10 on page 2. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, what can I do for you? It's uh, Peter Smith, isn't it? Yes, uh, I had a sporting accident and was treated by a doctor at home, but I'm still in pain. Hmm, right. I uh, just need to ask you a few questions, first of all. Fine. Now, uh, what sport were you doing? I was playing tennis. Mm -hmm, I see. And what was the nature of your injury? Did you hurt your elbow or wrist? Uh, no. I had a sprained knee. That was the original problem. Right. And when did this happen? Uh, it was three weeks ago now. So that was June 18th. Mm -hmm. Fine. And you say you had medical treatment? Yes. The doctor said I didn't need an x-ray or anything, and he just told me to use an ice pack. Mm -hmm. An ice pack. Fine. Yes, and I've been using a walking stick to help me get around. Right. Now, what problems are you experiencing at the moment? Are you having any problems walking? 
Well, I can walk okay, but I still can't go upstairs, so I've been sleeping downstairs. Hmm. Now, you say your knee still hurts? Well, no. Actually, it's recovering nicely. It's my back that's hurting me now. It really aches at night, and I can hardly sleep. Well, there's a few different things I can suggest for that. Great. First, you should put your stick away, as that's probably the source of the problem. It'll be making you unbalanced. Oh, really? I wish I'd known. After that, I can prescribe you something to relax the muscles in your back. Oh, sorry to be difficult, but I've had something like that in the past, and there were lots of side effects, and I had to stop taking it. Can you recommend anything else? Well, yes, we do have a leaflet showing some exercises you can do to help yourself at home. If you do them every day, they'll soon be effective. Great. I'll do that. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a radio announcer describing a city in New Zealand called Gisborne. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16 on page 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Greetings all you listeners out there. This is National Radio and I'm Kevin Lowe. This morning I'm going to tell you what's so special about the laid-back city of Gisborne. You'll hear a little bit about its past in the old days and a lot about what attractions it has to offer foreign and domestic visitors today. So listen up to learn more about what there is to do in this city and its surrounding region, where the economy is booming, but the lifestyle remains unspoiled. The Gisborne region is where the legendary canoe sailed by Maori explorers first landed in New Zealand about 1,400 years ago, after its long and risky voyage over the sea. It is also the easternmost point of the country, which is what inspired its original name, Te Tarafiti, which in the Maori language means the coast where the sun rises across the waters. Gisborne was also the place where the European explorer Captain Cook first landed his boat upon discovering New Zealand all the way from England back in 1769. Even in those early days, this district was a centre of horticulture, thanks to its fertile soil and subtropical climate. Soon after that, of course, the English settlers arrived, and soon Gisborne was shipping its products to larger settlements, 
such as Auckland and Wellington. This began with maize and root crops, but quickly expanded to butter, meat and wool from the agricultural settlements in the rich pastoral country near the famous Poverty Bay. Wharves and jetties were built beside the sea to service the coastal traders. Many of these wooden structures can still be seen on Gisborne beaches today. Today, Gisborne continues to export fresh produce to other regions of New Zealand. These wares include various award-winning cheeses and, of course, the delicious lobsters and snapper fish harvested by hand from the local reefs and waters. As for exports to Asian markets, there's an increasing demand for the region's oranges and lemons. Gisborne is also becoming well-known nationally and internationally as the source of some top-quality white and red grapes. Now, what's on in Gisborne? Well, first up, there's the annual Gisborne concert held every summertime. This is a great experience. It's held at Waiahikia Vineyard, which is near the traditional Maori meeting house, or Marae of the same name. They bring in a piano player and opera singers who perform on a purpose-built stage in a kind of natural amphitheatre in the middle of the rows of grapes. It's a fantastic concert-like atmosphere, a really good night out. What to do on a rainy day? I'd suggest a visit to the show called The Beach, which is on in Gallery 1 at Tairawhiti Museum. It's a big display, so it also takes up the hall next to Gallery 1. And it's divided into different sections of the local culture, like surfing, camping, fashion and so on. If you buy the book of the exhibition, there are some interesting photographs in there. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20 on page 4. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. There's a lot else to see in Gisborne as well. You shouldn't miss the Hot Springs Reserve, which has warm natural mineral pools and little houses where you can stay amongst the bush. Being very secluded and private, this resort is most favoured by newlyweds who often book a cabin for their honeymoon. The water is very therapeutic too. It's apparently good for your health to bathe there, though not recommended for pregnant women or the elderly. Around the corner is Mahia Peninsula, legendary as a New Year's Eve party destination for large crowds of university students after their graduation. The surfing and fishing here is excellent, and it's a safe spot for swimming and diving too. Now, also good for kids, is taking a raft or jet boat ride on the Motu River. This sounds quite wild, doesn't it? But in fact, this activity is often used by local primary schools who take big groups of young children, several classes at a time, out here for a bit of fun while they're on their school camp. No parents required. You can have some time out, as this activity is a lot safer than it sounds and is carefully supervised by the rafting company. Finally, don't let's forget the Eden Woodlands Park, which is really a huge tree nursery. You can walk for hours here, in the peaceful green surroundings, along a variety of tracks. There's even a very nice walkway, made wide enough for those in wheelchairs, so that everyone can go along and enjoy Mother Nature at her best.
That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear three marketing students discussing their research findings on vehicles known as SUVs or four-wheel drive vehicles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25 on page 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So guys, have you got all your notes on four-wheel drive vehicles? Shall we go through what we've each found and think about how we'll put it together for next week's marketing seminar? Mm. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's start with what these cars were originally designed for. Oh, I've got something on that here. Well, four-wheel drives, or sports utility vehicles as they are officially known, SUVs for short, were originally designed for off-road use by people who need to get to remote areas out in the bush, for instance. Mm. But the interesting thing is that they're actually sold now to a lot of people who just use them in cities, so they make quite different use of them. OK. Then maybe we should make a list of their advantages, shall we? So, one thing is that they're good for commercial use, OK? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, how about also saying uh, utilitarian rather than luxurious? So you're not paying out for unnecessary luxuries, OK? What else? Well, um, they have increased engine capacity and they're also heavier, so suitable for towing large loads. So is this why so many people buy them then? Well, no. They seem to have become fashionable now for rather different reasons. Research carried out by automobile clubs shows that people buy them for business because of the sort of image they project. And mums uh, like to drive their kids to school in them because they think they're safe. So that's another reason. And you can get about seven people into one of these. So we could say seating capacity is another factor. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, another thing that came out of my research is that people also like the higher seats. Mm. They say it means they can get a better view of the traffic ahead of them. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30 on page 6. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But, you know, some of these reasons just don't work. I mean, the safety thing is just a misconception. Because generally, in a collision, they can do terrible damage to a smaller car. Mm, that's right. That's one of the disadvantages I have here. Uh, shall we go through those now? Mm, good idea. So, let's say that potentially they are harmful in built-up areas. Generally, the damage they cause is due to their weight. That's right, isn't it? Yes, it is. I, 
I've got a note here about their chassis. The bodywork on an SUV is stiffer and doesn't crumple to absorb impact in a collision the way it does in smaller cars. And there's another reason why they're not safe. It's quite easy for them to roll over, mm. more so than an ordinary car, because they've got a high centre of gravity. So these are all the disadvantages. How are we going to round this up? Well, um, I think maybe we could round up with a few ideas of how we can limit the use of these SUVs. One thing that could be done is to limit them to people like farmers, who can prove that they need them. Mm, that's good, but it might be hard to enforce. Well, companies could also increase the insurance for SUVs, since they cause more damage when there's an accident. Mm, that's <laughs> a good idea, too. Um, I tell you what, guys, I'll write up these notes onto an OHT so that everyone can see them when we talk through our notes in the seminar. Um, but I think we need to put together a list of our sources, too. Yeah. Uh, can you do that? Sure, no problem. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a university professor giving a lecture on the influence of children on the adult diet. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 7 and 8. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we continue with our series of lectures on diet and society in the 21st century. We are all aware of the obesity epidemic facing our society. The reasons for this are well documented and are mainly due to poor eating habits coupled with too little exercise. In fact, a National Health and Nutrition Survey here in the U.S. concluded that the average total food intake increased considerably between the years 1971 and 2000. This appears to be a general trend across most age groups. In fact, apart from the over 60s, all areas of American society are consistently above the dietary guidelines for caloric intake and saturated fat. However, Total fat consumption is highest for teenagers, and there is a clear correlation with fast food consumption. Among the wide range of factors influencing an individual's dietary choices, one of the strongest influences is the home. It will come as no surprise that within a family, the fat intakes of husbands and wives and parents and children who cohabit are remarkably similar. Many people assume that this relationship indicates the influence of parents on their children, but we wanted to ask if children influence poor diets in adults. This hypothesis had not been tested in a national sample until now. In our study, we focused only on adults, 
and we set our lower age limit at 17 and the upper one at 65. The key variable was the presence or absence of children, so we identified only those adults whose children were under 17. Other variables included the age of the adult, level of education they had reached, their ethnic background, their income, and foreign-born status. To obtain our data, first we conducted interviews in the respondents' own homes, and all in all we interviewed 6,600 adults aged over 17. Then we invited them to mobile examination centers where surveys were conducted. From this information, we were able to focus not only on the total fat intake, but also on the person's total caloric consumption. Our results show that the presence of children led to significantly higher levels of both fat consumption and saturated fat in adults. We found on average that adults with children in the home ate 4.9 grams per day of fat more than adults without children. This result is consistent irrespective of race, gender, or age. The foods more commonly were convenience items high in fat or sugar, including pizza, salty snacks, and ice cream. Interestingly, there is a significantly higher percentage of adults in this group who drink milk. There are many explanations for this increased fat intake, Hectic schedules where parents try to balance work, family, and leisure put time at a premium. Another issue is children's preference for fatty foods or foods with a high sugar content. Fast foods and ready-to-eat foods are convenient choices. It is inconvenient to prepare different meals for both the children and the parents, so it is likely that adults consume the same as their children. Of course, there were limitations to our study. One of these is that we did not take into account the number of minors in each household, which could have an effect on the adult who feeds the children. In addition, this study does not take into account the relationship of the adult to the minor. We could also postulate that the older a child gets, the more independent he or she becomes, and so the influence a child has on an adult may lessen depending on the age of the child. In terms of recommendations as a result of this study, we would like to see more research conducted to overcome the limitations outlined earlier. We also feel there is a need for even further research into the influence that friends can have on our fat intake, given the clear link we've established between family members. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.